Thank you for the invitation, Professor. Uh, it, will, it is really a pleasure for me to speak about uh, my usual practice of performing sleep investigation using mainly their uh, home sleep study. And uh, this is we, uh, the uh, topic I will develop in the next uh, uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, we'll briefly mention the importance of epidemiology for obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, um, the, I will also uh, um, make uh, a statement about the increasing indication for obstructive sleep apnea. And so therefore the unmet diagnostic capacity for uh, obstructive sleep apnea. I will also uh, uh, highlight the difference in scoring between polysomnography and the home sleep studies. We'll uh, in depth discuss about autonomic arousal surrogate, which I use in their uh, improvement of the scoring of my patients. Uh, we'll uh, mention also about uh, the diagnostic accuracy of home sleep study and its cost effectiveness. I would also specify that uh, home sleep study is increasingly studied uh, in uh, specific settings, which uh, um, at the moment are considered excluded by home sleep study. We'll also briefly introduce the new technique that is the pulse transit time for the determination of arousal and I may make some conclusions. So overall, we know that uh, uh, sleep apnea uh, in terms of as defined by a sleep study is extremely prevalent. One in four men entering a GP practice is likely to, to have uh, obstructive sleep apnea but only 4% report symptoms related to sleep apnea. But even if we consider this in a, a very young settings for between 35 and 60 years, uh, we know that obstructive sleep apnea is not limited to young age. It's actually, this was their group that was considered in the study of prevalence, but is also present in elderly population. Uh, we also know that the, the younger the patients are, the more mild is likely to be the condition. And when we talk about these numbers, and even if we are very conservative, we are talking about uh, 340,000 people affected by symptomatic obstructive sleep apnea in the whole UAE, and about uh, uh, 67,000 people, 68,000 people in, the only, in Dubai. We know also that uh, this was statement was also uh, strengthened by our friend, uh, uh, Professor Bassam Mamakbut, and uh, uh, in a um, study which he published in 2013, saying that uh, in GP practice, sleep apnea is a common condition. We know that uh, sleep apnea has been uh, quite often uh, considered an important role for road traffic accidents and it's been associated with cognitive impairment and depression. But now we have increasing evidence about the importance of their uh, um, condition associated with cardiovascular conditions. So we know that, and, and metabolic condition as well, we know that intermittent hypoxemia, sleep fragmentation, and large intrinsic pressure swings uh, have consequences in terms of ox oxidative stress, uh, sympathetic nervous system activation, hypothalamic pituitary, adrenal axis activation, and increased cardiac preload and afterload. So all this make uh, causes consequences that are subclinical, like uh, elevated blood pressure, uh, increased metabolic dysregulation, uh, systemic inflammation, and the endothelial dysfunction, myocardial dysfunction but it makes also an important association with important clinical aspects of the life of our patients. We're talking about uh, association with hypertension, type two diabetes, coronary heart disease, cerebral vascular disease, arrhythmia, in particular atrial fibrillation and heart failure. So all these are, uh, now guidelines of these cardiovascular conditions and metabolic condition like diabetes include the sleep apnea as a, a condition that must be considered and investigated. So we have a significant uh, strong epidemiological pre prevalence and the, the uh, um, association with an increased uh, indication to investigate sleep apnea in our population. 
So, but the, obviously we need to ask ourselves how many patients undergo the sleep diagnostic testing and how many are actually diagnosed with sleep apnea and how many are treated in our country. So UAE certainly uh, has their potential to do much well compared to other countries as we have a mixed public and private system. However, uh, certainly there is still a huge discrepancy between our capacity of diagnostic and their, the prevalence of the condition and the importance of the indications. Um, so that's why we need to something that is feasible and home sleep study probably, and I'm going to demonstrate here, is the uh, way to uh, uh, match this unmet needs. Um, it's very important, however, to define what uh, the uh, portable monitors are able to score and how this compares to polysomnography. The, in 2020, the American Association of Sleep Medicine uh, um, um, uh, restated the, the definition. And starting with the sleep apnea, we talk about apneas. And apneas are better scored with uh, um, a probe called thermistor. And uh, this is because the thermistor has a higher sensitivity in terms of low flow. Uh, um, obviously, uh, the defined and the definition didn't change over the years of uh, sleep, of being apnea, uh, a reduction in the flow of at least 90% for a duration of minimum test seconds. Can we detect uh, uh, apneas in, with a portable? Yes, easily detectable. We can see here, for example, that there is nearly a flat line in their uh, flow recorded by the thermistor here. And uh, uh, this is also uh, in association with continuous movement of the chest wall. And so we define this as an obstructive apnea. Can portable monitors and uh, home sleep study detect only obstructive apneas? No, uh, you can easily also detect central apneas. So this is again a flattening of their thermistor flow and is associated with a flattening of their uh, um, thoracic and abdominal movements. So this is a central apnea. And you can easily see this is uh, easily detectable and they're associated. There is no possibility to make errors on this. Um, what about mixed apneas? Also mixed apnea are detected not as easy as central or obstructive apnea because uh, a mixed apnea by definition is uh, uh, the presence of uh, um, both obstructive and central apneas. Usually starts with uh, um, a central apnea and their, uh, uh, movement is detectable at the end of their uh, breathing pause. And, so, and we call this mixed apneas. Overall, they are expression of uh, uh, obstruction uh, of apneas, uh, in, but with the component of central uh, uh, part. So uh, uh, now, uh, what about hypopneas? For, for hypopneas, we use a different type of transducer, which is the nasal cannula. Why the nasal cannula? It's because the nasal cannula is much more sensitive in detecting the changes in the flow as compared to the thermistor. And uh, the limitation of the nasal cannula is that uh, uh, quite often is used without uh, uh, a probe that measures the changes in their uh, mouth. And for example, it might be a big limitation for mouth breather, but we do have also oral nasal cannula that can be uh, tailored to match their uh, structure of the face of the patient. Um, so uh, overall, it's very important to have both transducer. And for example, in my home sleep study, I use both transducer, one to detect the apneas and the other one to detect the hypopneas. But how is hypopnea defined? So the, the definition of hypopnea has changed over the time. And in the last uh, uh, manual uh, for scoring uh, uh, sleep disorders of the American Association of Sleep Medicine, they define hypopnea as a reduction in the flow of 30% for a minimum of 10 seconds associated with a 3% oxygen desaturation or arousal. Um, now, 
because uh, obviously not all people have access to full, full positive insonography, they also accepted an alternative scoring where they uh, accept a 30% reduction in airflow with a minimum of 10% dissociation associated with an oxygen saturation of 4%. But does this make sense? Because, you know, uh, the 3% scoring is already an alternative in their main uh, definition of hypopnea. And it, it does not make sense if you look in this way, but knowing that most centers don't look at the American Association of Sleep Medicine, but at the centers of Medicare and medical Medicaid services, where they define the hypopnea in a completely different matter. Uh, they uh, are made as a principal diagnosis uh, drop in airflow of 30% for 10 seconds with the 4% uh, oxygen desaturation. Uh, and this is the reason now while the American Association of Sleep Medicine decided to accept this definition as an alternative definition. Uh, they, uh, you know, it all makes sense. Uh, it also makes sense that the, the Medicaid services uh, consider for the association with a 3% and arousal, a reduction of at least 50% of the flow. So there we are, we got the explanation for that uh, unusual type of definition for the American Association of Sleep Medicine. And can we detect uh, easily this hypopnea? Yes, we can. Uh, I use the 3% definition of the saturation. And so easily we can see this is a more than 30% uh, drop in the flow uh, through our cannula. And this is uh, associated with oxygen desaturation. And every time we have a drop in the flow, we have a drop in oxygen saturation. And there we score the hypopnea. Uh, apart from this one, but we'll explain later on what is this one. Um, so overall, uh, it's important to consider that the uh, apnea, hypopnea definition are uh, different in different settings. And so it's very important to declare which type of definition are used in the scoring of your apnea, hypopnea index. We also are, know that uh, quite often we hear about uh, what, uh, another model of scoring uh, with the measure of uh, respiratory effort related arousals. Now, uh, this is defined by the American Association of Sleep Medicine as a flattening of the nasal pressure waveform or evidence of increasing respiratory effort associated with an EEG arousal. So does this mean that uh, RERAs, so respiratory effort related arousals are scored only by polysonography? And um, this is what it looks like in polysonography. We have a change in the EEG uh, indicating that there is a micro arousal, means uh, uh, people are moving uh, from a different stage to another one probably there is a change, a sharp change in the electrical activity. And obviously we see here is associated a change in the respiratory pattern and also reflected by esophageal pressure. Uh, however, uh, that is possible in polysonography and I state here that I can do in my home sleep study too. Uh, I use uh, what we call autonomic arousal surrogate uh, it means these microarousal quite frequently are associated with a sharp increase in the uh, um, uh, heart rate. And there, this increase can easily be detected by their uh, uh, pulse oximeter or eventually by uh, uh, the use of an easy in their portable monitor. And there, uh, there are, however, a different definition of this sharp increase. It can be used like a five beats per minute change of eight or 10. And obviously the definition implies about a change in sensitivity and specificity. Uh, sensitivity is, is very important, uh, 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 but uh, I found that five beats per minute uh, pick up also too frequently 
um, erratic changes in the heart rate. So in my case, I prefer to use the um, uh, eight beat per minute increase as a surrogate for uh, arousal. Uh, obviously, their uh, RERAs are there to be counted. So when we count them, the, we add on to their apnea hypopnea index. And we'll make a bigger number than the apnea hypopnea index. Why we need to make a newer uh, number, and we call this respiratory distress index, is because the RDI, respiratory distress disturbance index, is associated with uh, more uh, with cognitive impairment. Now, why is important to uh, consider to measure arousals in the portable monitor is because we can detect more hypopneas then reducing the gap between their apnea hypopnea index recorded by a full polysonographer and the uh, home sleep study. And so here we can easily detect their reduction in the flow of at least 30%, which is associated with increase in the heart rate is also present here. Again, an increase in the heart rate. It goes down further here. Again, an increase in the heart rate and here, there you are. And here too, we have an increase in the heart rate. So we have hypopneas with associated arousal. Uh, again, this is a surrogate of the EEG arousal and not all arousal can be uh, detected by autonomic uh, changes, uh, but it is a significant improvement as compared to not counting these events. Uh, flattening of their uh, airflow can occur also without uh, respiratory event related arousal. For example, here we have a reduction of the flow. Uh, however, there is no change in the heart rate, no other significant changes. Uh, however, we can also detect what we call the RERA without hypopneas. And we determine this because it is associated with this sharp increase in the heart rate is associated with a reduction in the platysmography calculated by our uh, thoracic and abdominal belts. And you can see here at every sharp increase in the heart rate, there is a reduction in the platysmogram. And this is also here, easy detectable. This is also associated with a sharp change in the breathings. And this is probably also associated with the uh, 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 movement as well. So uh, is home sleep study as good as polysonography? So this question has been already answered and the quality of the answer is of level A. So we have very strong evidence that in certain conditions, it means when the patient is symptomatic and the pre-test probability of obstructive sleep apnea is high, uh, there is uh, the home sleep study is able to detect easily uh, the great majority of their uh, cases with the reasonable accuracy of their severity. And uh, uh, this is also our, uh, true as shown here, where we have a sensitivity that is around 90% and above. And it was stated since 2017, but not only is uh, uh, as efficient and non-inferior to polysonography in detecting obstructive sleep apnea, but is also cost effective. You can easily see here the cost of uh, um, a portable uh, uh, device to be significantly cheaper than an inpatient full polysonography. And this has been studied in different models and uh, overall is important to have an idea how to use their home sleep study and reserving again the full polysonography only for complicated cases or where their pretest probability is low for obstructive sleep apnea. And so we, for example, we consider more probable other type of sleep conditions. Uh, in my case, I use the same scheme as in this scheme that was published in 2003 by Coral However, I uh, make it more simple and I think we, you can use the portable device only for uh, inter medium intermediate uh, um, risk of obstructive sleep apnea. 
a uh, few more questions and then I will open to questions. Uh, is uh, full polysonography possible at home? It has been proven that it's possible and we can set up the machine in, in their clinic and then the patient can go and sleep at home. Uh, we know that it is uh, uh, feasible to use portable sleep monitor for uh, the follow-up of the patient with the sleep apnea. And this has been also recommended by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. We know that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, also feasible in neuromuscular disorders, although the sensitivity is around 80 to 90% uh, um, in certain, for uh, uh, certain situation and drops when uh, we're talking about uh, detecting the severity of the condition. Um, it's feasible in heart failure. I show you that it's easy to detect the uh, uh, central apneas. It's also easy to detect their, uh, their uh, time stop respiration. And so it is possible. And is it possible in adolescents? Yes, feasible, very uh, uh, similar to adults. And in children is a little bit more complicated because children tend to remove the probes and there is still two uh, further steps to do. Um, just uh, a final information is we have now newer techniques called the pulse transit time is essentially the measure of time from the um, heartbeat and the time uh, the wave is detected in the periphery. And uh, we know that if there is a drop in this uh, time, uh, it, it is associated with uh, uh, arousals and this has a significantly higher capability of detecting EEG arousal as compared to the um, um, uh, autonomic uh, increase of the heart rate. Uh, so overall, uh, it was also found that this uh, showed that in 45 children measuring a portable polysonography with this newer technique, there was no uh, uh, underestimation of the apnea hypopnea index. Uh, in conclusion, I uh, would say that uh, different uh, definitions are important, and so we need to uh, uh, declare what we are measuring, how we are measuring it, uh, to reduce the entropy of caused by different societies. Uh, we need to um, uh, consider that the home sleep study does not evaluate sleep structure, but it easily detects sleep breathing disorders. It is uh, a limit of home sleep uh, portable studies to be able to detect only time in bed, not sleep time. And this obviously brings an intrinsic um, a minor underestimation of the index. Uh, we now have evidence that uh, e, uh, um, uh, EEG arousal can be uh, surrogated by uh, uh, heart rate uh, and uh, by the pulse transit time and uh, we know that their uh, portable uh, home sleep study is not only cost efficient, but is at least non inferior in detecting obstructive sleep apnea. Thank you very much. So I'm open to question now. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fabrizio. Excellent talk. Uh, we do have a few questions, and if you allow me, I can read it for you. Yes, now, please. Uh, one of them is about insomnia, so I'll leave it to Dr. Saeed Akabi. Uh, the other one is someone is asking, what is the best primary health promotion prevention care for uh, sleep apnea? So if you'd like to do maybe some health promotion for family doctors, what so, would be your uh, advice? I am uh, strengthening and my colleagues are becoming more and more sensitive on this and referring more patients there. Uh, because is now in the official guidelines of the major societies for um, uh, um, uh, hypertension, for diabetes, and for heart, uh, um, uh, heart fibrillation and, and cardiac arrhythmias to look at the possibility that these conditions are actually favored induced by uh, obstructive sleep apnea. So for example, uh, I some, quite often I get rejection from insurances about uh, the investigation, uh, but then the insurances have to uh, rethink about their uh, rejection when I uh, report them that this is a, requ a requirement by the guidelines. 
And there, the fact that uh, I, we, we have been able to help many patients with this condition has favored and increased the referral rate from our, our GPs. Very good. So, so basically, uh, we're talking about awareness. Uh, we need more awareness about the risk of obstructive sleep apnea, the risk not only on the cardiovascular uh, and also immunity. We're, we're in the era of pandemic, and we do have enough evidence that severe obstructive sleep apnea uh, and COVID-19 can lead to more hospitalization, mechanical ventilation. Uh, it's also linked to road traffic collisions and uh, accidents during work. And this is a question here from Dr. Mona Hamadi. She said, does GCAA approve the home sleep study? And uh, I may answer this question if you allow me, uh, Dr. Fabrizio, uh, the answer is no. And there is a reason behind this, a uh, big no for uh, professional drivers, pilots. You see the problem with home sleep study it does not have EEG. So I, we could give a home sleep study to someone who could stay awake at home watching TV uh, through the whole night coming back and that would be negative. So and, uh, it comes with a limitation when it comes to a high risk uh, professional. And therefore, uh, and again, if it is negative, you still have, regardless if you are suspecting a sleep apnea and the home sleep testing comes negative, that does not rule out obstructive sleep apnea. And you still have to do a full polis monography, uh, which is the, uh, the gold standard. It's one of the issues, uh, unfortunately, not everyone like Dr. Fabrizio who's looking himself at the sleep testing. There's a practice, unfortunately, where the, the, the CBAP vendors are the one who's doing the home sleep testing. Unfortunately, again, uh, without mentioning where, but across the country, they are not certified, they're not sleep technologists. And what they do, they hook up the patients, they come the next day, they do the auto scoring, and almost everyone is obstructive sleep apnea and everyone on the CBAP because there's a clear conflict of interest. So this is why we're staying away from home testing because the practice, unfortunately, if you look at the AASM, it stated that if you do home sleep testing, it needs to be administered and it needs to be scored by a certified sleep technologist and have a sleep physician to look at it. And this is not the case in, I would say, unfortunate 90% of the practice that we see. Here, I think we need to stop and talk, uh, frankly, and this is a good time. We have time if you like, Dr. Fabrizio. We all understand that home testing is really a good strategy for certain group who comes to you with a very positive predictive value. They come to your office, you see them, they're obese with a big neck, they're snoring. Someone with a very high positive predictive value of obstructive sleep apnea, a home testing would be excellent choice. The question is who should do the testing? It should not be done by the CBAP vendors. If they're listening to us, that's okay. It's not allowed to be done by the CBAP. It should be done by a sleep technologist. It should be scored, I should say, by a sleep technologist and it should be read by someone with experience in sleep medicine to make a decision. Uh, once this regulated, then I think we should have then more trust on the home testing. Now, there's something else that we did not talk about is types of home testing. Some of the type of home testing coming in the market is really weird where you do the testing, it goes into the cloud. They said uh, it goes into somewhere without mentioning some part in, in Europe. It comes back with a report. Now, where's the raw data and how many events? I like what Dr. Fabrizio is doing. He's, he's showing you the events he can discuss and say, this is a hypopnea and this is apnea. This is important, but you cannot really believe uh, at least on, on an algorithm at this moment that has not been even validated and approved by the, uh, the ASM and by the International Society. Uh, so a, a very clear message, 
that we'd like to see here, a uh, part of the sleep disorder group from the uh, Emirates Thoracic Society, that home sleep testing is really having an important role of testing. Uh, it can be very cost effective, but it should be done at the right population and should be scored and read by the right uh, competent physician. With this, I think we will have ready a, a, an improvement, a improvement in the quality of care for our patients. Uh, uh, Dr. Fabrizio, would you like to add anything? Just briefly, because I don't want to take time to my colleagues, but yes, it's very important. Uh, we spent hours and hours in looking at our sleep studies. It's not only important in the scoring properly, but the analysis of the sleep has clues for a condition that might be unexpected. For example, cardiac arrhythmias or the presence of a condition like the concentration of uh, uh, episodes of apneas in uh, uh, um, late in the morning or early in the morning or uh, in the night. Or uh, it, 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 these, uh, uh, in addition, they, uh, we found that uh, automatic scoring, even when the uh, major vendors like uh, Philips Respironics, not to make any name, they say they have uh, smart, super extra, um, fantastic, uh, they are not able to detect properly their the events. Uh, RERAs are hardly seen properly. The uh, uh, quite often central is uh, uh, you know, miscored or as uh, obstructive or vice versa. For example, even the heart rate in a thin patient with a, a, a sleep apnea can uh, uh, present uh, obstructive, uh, clearly central apnea because the heart rate uh, is actually recorded by their thoracic and abdominal abdomen. So you have to look at the data you have. And if you do that and you do properly, you can really make it your testing reliable. And uh, um, I noticed that uh, there is a huge correspondence between my patient reported symptoms and their, their, their findings when it's scored carefully. Um, and yes, I think about aviation. I have heard stories of people even asking the sister to wear the, 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 yep. the portable. Yeah. So yeah, no, we've, seen, yeah, we've seen many stories, so there's critical, uh, again, uh, issues there. And I think uh, a uh, a the gold standard still the in-lab pulse monography uh, for now for a high-risk patients uh, and, I'm and comor as well as people with comorbidity, as well as patients who you suspect that they are obstructive sleep apnea, you do the home testing, it comes negative but you still believe that they have it, then yes, refer them for the gold standard pulse monography. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Fabrizio. A very uh, thorough presentation.